Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back to another edition of Real Conversations, where it's my privilege to have my friend Larry Kudlow, who really doesn't need an introduction, but he does have the Larry Kudlow radio show. I think he's syndicated pretty much everywhere, print and uh, otherwise. Uh, so, Larry, thanks for taking some time to talk. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to talk to you. I mean, you did a great job in this uh, in this National Review. Uh, I guess you just kind of hammed it up as to what you thought the last five years of the economy looked like. So, prospectively, just kind of take it from there where you think that this economy is going to go from here. Well, look, um, the, the key point is that we're weak at home and that this is the worst recovery in the post-World War II period. And Obama has departed from free market supply-side policies, and we have a heavier tax burden, a much heavier regulatory burden. And, and a guy who's generally anti-business, one of the more <laughs> ridiculous, amusing things is this new idea of economic patriotism, because American corporations would like to pay lower taxes so their shareholders have a higher rate of return. And if they have to park cash overseas or if they have to reincorporate overseas, somehow this is a bad thing. In other words, they're, they're not patriotic. Yeah. On the other hand, I would argue that if the United States government did something in favor of our businesses, defended our businesses, which is to say to slash corporate tax rates so we're competitive globally, that would be patriot. So in other words, you'd say you go to the causal factor, which is high rates are preventing people from not making these decisions, and the output is you know, investing overseas. So why don't you just change the tax rates? Yeah, I mean, the answer is not to blame the companies. The answer is to blame the tax code. And the solution is to reform the tax code. And, mm -hmm. you know, rates... Look, I would abolish the corporate tax altogether. I think that would be very pro-growth, help the workers who would get 70% of the benefits, consumers with benefits, and individuals can pay the capital gains tax and the dividend tax. That would be far more efficient. But what we've got is a 35 to 40% tax rate. Around the world, it's running about 25%. Some countries, it's 15 to 20 So how... Why, why are we blaming American business? Well, I'll tell you, because President Obama loves to blame American business because he's fundamentally a redistributor. Uh, he's fundamentally a guy uh, who would rather tax in order to raise funds to spend on his pet projects. You know, think of cylindras everywhere. And he has no feel for how business works. He's never understood it. To him, businesses are useful only when they do him favors, like contribute to his campaigns or, you know, run unprofitable uh, energy companies and things. Well, like I think you're being kind here. You're calling them, you're only going to call them a redistributor? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, that, that, that's, that's quite polite of you today. Larry, well, I'm a polite I appreciate person. It. I'm yeah. a polite guy tonight. But does he really, get, like, who gets it, if anyone, on the policy side? And we could take this both the, the fiscal and corporate side, or we could take a monetary policy side. Who actually gets it that would be advising him on these matters? Well, the truth is, he's had some smart people around him, but they behaved very badly. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. You know, I... Uh, Wait, so they behaved like Keynesian economists? Lefties. They, look, um... Are Keynesian economists lefties? Yeah, Keynesian, if you're a solid Keynesian, sure. Look, Larry Summers, let's go to Larry Summers, my favorite. See, at least you didn't go to Piketty right out of the bat. Let's go to Summers, and then we'll move left from there. Yeah, I mean, Summers is, uh, was his top guy in the first term. Summers is a very smart guy. Summers is a centrist. He and I don't agree on everything. He's not a supply sider. But Summers was a guy who worked for Bill Clinton and Bob Rubin, and they cut the capital gains tax. They were worried about excessive federal spending. They used the bond market as an indicator of the health of the economy or, or, or not and kept a strong dollar, okay? And I regard Clinton's uh, years as Reagan's third term, and I would say Clinton slash Gingrich did a pretty darn good job, particularly in the second term. So now, fast forward to 2009, and you got the same guy, Larry Summers, sitting in a key position in the White House, acting like a left-wing Keynesian. And all of a sudden, uh, heavy, heavy spending and taxing is somehow a good thing and that there's something called fiscal multipliers that is going to magically uh, turn government spending into economic growth. Yeah, there's no magic and there's no multiplier. That clearly didn't work. Yeah, but what's interesting to me, Larry, and it, it's kind of um, 
to me, not being a Republican or a Democrat, thank God, I mean, I, I sit here and I watch both the Republican and Democrat Party on particularly monetary policy sides, and it's almost like taboo. You know, it's, it's, it, I think it's easy to, it, pretty easy to make you know, the supply side argument on taxes, but on the, on the monetary policy side, it feels like neither party has anyone who's just going to stand up and say, look, a weak dollar is imposing a cost of living tax on Americans, therefore the structural impact on consumption growth, which is 70% of the economy, as you know, is going to be in a secular downtrend. Why don't people get this? I just want to comment on your earlier point. It's a lovely point. You said I'm neither Republican nor Democrat. Do you remember what Margaret Thatcher said, Keith? People who stand in the middle of the road get hit by cars going both ways. <laughs> you, know, you, you have to choose at some point. I admit that the GOP can be highly flawed. I admit that. And sometimes the Democrats, like JFK Democrats, I'm writing a book on this subject. JFK was a supply-side economist. But you do have to pick and choose at some point. Well, I think, I mean, what I mean by that is actually do, it is a choice. There is, there, uh, to me, from a, from, a, from a monetary policy perspective, there's absolutely no difference between what uh, Mitt Romney was suggesting and what Obama is running on. They all fundamentally believe, believe that... The, You've got a lot of hard uh, money guys, uh, particularly in the House of Representatives. You've got some hard money guys in the Senate. Look, don't, they're holding hearings. Uh, Jeb Henserling, who's the head of the House Financial Services Committee, is holding hearings to generate uh, sound money, Federal Reserve policy, uh, governed by rules. And I like that. I think that's exactly right. The Fed should be accountable. They're not accountable. Uh, I have no idea what the Fed is doing. Uh, the Fed had Janet Yellen, who is a brilliant woman, but a liberal Keynesian. She's got about 25 labor market indicators. It makes my head spin. I don't know how you run policy. <laughs> You've got all these labor. And, and the odd thing, the ironic thing is, the Federal Reserve has no long-term impact on employment at all. In fact, the Fed has no long-term impact on any real variables in the economy, like jobs and investment. Milton Friedman taught us that. Uh, I don't know, 50 years ago in his presidential speech to the American Economics Association in 1968. So not only does she have 25 indicators, but she's got the whole story wrong. Well, because she's going back to what you appropriately called out in your National Review article, which is the Phillips curve. And, you know, but there's absolutely, so you'd agree, which history would agree, so it's hard for me to have you disagree, that inflation and unemployment have no relationship. Look. They might have the shortest-term relationship, but they have no long-term relationship, and you're better off not even messing with it. Paul, it's interesting. I, I came across a, a interview, an interview. Uh, Paul Volcker, who went to Princeton, don't hold that against him, I did too, but he was interviewed by the Daily Princetonian, and they were talking about the Phillips curve. And the interviewer, you know, said, blah, 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 uh, you know, unemployment and inflation, Volcker said, it's not true. He said, the only reason you're talking about that is because you're reading it in textbooks, and they're giving you the wrong textbooks at Princeton. He said, there is no trade-off between inflation and unemployment. I just love that. The guy's, whatever, 85, he's sharp as a tack, and he's smarter than everybody in the Federal Reserve Board. So the point is, more people working, getting better wages for their uh, effort, does not cause inflation, Ms. Yellen. As long as you keep the value of money stable, as long as you keep king dollar, as long as you keep an eye on gold and, 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 and commodities and treasury yield curves, you're going to be just fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, heaven forbid we should have low unemployment and rising wages. I mean, that to me is the silliest thing. And Reagan knew that. And the people around Reagan knew that. And, in fact, the whole point is low inflation is a tax cut. And that paves the way for strong growth. Now, that's my problem with the whole. The Federal Reserve today is like a university of econometric professors <laughs> who have no real world experience. There isn't a business person on the Fed. I don't think there's a banker on the Fed. In the old days, when I came up the ranks, the Fed used to have a lot of people on the board uh, and the reserve banks uh, with real world experience. These guys are a bunch of eggheads. 